record on this computer. All right, sorry for starting a bit late today. Um, so first and foremost, uh, um, let's talk about exams and let's talk about Thursday. So exams, uh, T your TAs are busy, grading, are busy grading your exams if they haven't finished grading them already. Your TAs and I met Saturday evening and I gave them directions on how to grade things, but as, but do the general rule of thumb, and I just to be completely transparent that I gave them, is that if they're given choice between grading leniently and uh, more strictly, I told them to grade more strictly because you can always come back to me and make an argument as to why you deserve more points. Okay, that's generally the rule. It also makes, and, and, gen, and some of these TAs are grading the exams for the first time. You know, we were sitting down together and doing this, but, you know, event, just for the first couple months so that they could, answer, so I could answer their questions. And that rule generally means that make sure that, you know, students don't get awarded points where they shouldn't. However, they sometimes make mistakes. If they make mistakes, I'm the final arbiter for that. Um, so please, if you feel like you, if you feel like you deserve too many points, um, so if you feel like you got too few points and you deserve more, please tell me. If you got too many points for a question where you know you shouldn't have, I mean, it's in your best interest to, main quiet, to be quiet, doesn't it? Even though I do appreciate that honesty. But honestly, the point being is I don't take points away after the fact, okay? Um, so don't feel, feel like you're going to be jeopardizing anything by coming and speaking to me, okay? Okay, I honor points that have been given. Um, unless, of course, you've been given like a thousand points out of 20 or 200 out of 20, in which case, you know, that's an obvious mistake and we'll have to fix that. Um, okay, furthermore, for so again, if you have any ex questions about the exam, please come speak to me. Also, I will be grading the group exams. I plan on really hammering those tonight. Your TAs may have started grading them already, but uh, I asked them if they could, but I said I would do, I would be responsible for doing most of them. Now, so I'll try to get try to get those done to uh, you know within the next couple of days for the group exam. Well, the way that will work is that if for some reason your group exam grade is lower than the, your your solo grade, I will leave your your group exam grade as what it, it as what you scored for a couple of days or for enough time to let you see it, and then later on I'll go and make sure to raise that that group exam grade so that it doesn't impact your grade. Okay. In other words, the minimum that you can get on a group exam is what you scored on your solo exam. And that and that and the math works out that prevents it from hurting you. It's really that that's what it comes down to. Now, with regards to Thursday, I'm thinking that I will do Thursday as a online Zoom class. So rather than meeting in. Now, this isn't because I want to now it isn't because I want to get an early start on spring break because I'm not going to be able to, because I have stuff to do on Friday too. But it has to do more with the fact that with that the upcoming assignment on, on Friday, the, sorry, on Friday and the upcoming Monday is going to be the hurricane tracker, which I've already created the due date for. And I created the due date for hurricane tracker under the assumption that like spring break doesn't exist in the sense that for the academic calendar where I expect you to work. Uh, so I don't expect you to work on it. In other words, where I normally I'd give you a week to, to work on it. Technically, you have two weeks to work on it, but I don't expect you to be doing anything for one of those weeks. Well, okay, let's be clear. I expect you to delay any work that you've been given over spring break into the Sunday before you come back. Because that's what you because that's what we do. It's we're just, it's just human nature. Um so the re so but the reason that this so why does this impact Thursday? Why does this mean that Thursday will be online? So Thursday's lecture will basically be half me giving a lecture and then half uh, then ha the other half of it uh, troubleshooting uh, for students who do not get it to work. So on on Thursday I plan on going over file reading. It is one of my favorite things about Python because it's so bloody easy to do in Python. I mean, oh my God, when I started programming in in I think 05 maybe where it was just like just trying to really open some a file in Java. Oh my God, the amount of wrappers that I had to put around something. I think I was like nested four parentheses deep just to open up a file. 
Never mind trying to actually just read the constants of it. But for Python, that was super easy. That being said, it's very easy to also mess it up if it's your first time around. By mess it up, I mean just ma simply make a mistake. And that mistake is 99% times you didn't put the file you're trying to read and the Python file in the same place. And so most of my lecture will be troubleshooting that for students because uh, file browser file systems can sometimes be a bit tricky. So if you have been organizing all your stuff into like a folder, now would be the time to, to do that. Now, the reason I put the, I bring this up is that because your hurricane tracker, your 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 um your assignment for lab seven is kind of our um our capstone here for in terms of or for for the midway point. It is the culmination of basically every skill you are learning, uh, you have learned up until this point. Um, and honestly, if, if for, for like, I think in like, if you were in high school, if you got to this point, this would be kind of the end of that, that curriculum. So we moved fairly quickly in this terms of this. But um, the way that, but you'll notice that I've got giant bold text here. Um, because this is one of the few, this is one of the few assignments where I have an instant fail instant fail clause just simply to save me time. Um, demoing this assignment and getting an error due to a misplaced file will result in an instant zero and with no appeal. Meaning that if you run it and it gives me a file not found exception, yeah, don't do that. That generally means you did not write your own code or you did not learn how this worked in the first place, or you just coded it without ever testing it. Now there can be a case made for v VS Code where you actually have to like open the folder structure, which is a bit tricky if you're using VS Code. But in general, so if you're having trouble working with this one in VS Code, I recommend just trying this one in idle. But that that shouldn't scare you because of course the only way you can get to zero is if you demo it and you and it, you get that exception and like you can turn it in and it's perfectly fine and then you know, make sure it runs before you come and run it right in front of us. It's so it's not going to suddenly stop working. Now, what the hurricane tracker does is basically it will read an ex, it will read a CSV file, which is a very simple version of what uh, it's one of those files that if you double click it, it will naturally uh, open up into um, into Excel. Um, but it's a text file, so it's very easy for files to read. And what it is is that it's going to give you the position of a hurricane and its lab, you know, and how intense it was. And so you'll be able to use, and so you're going to be, you know, drawing the path of, of this hurricane from the file. And it looks like this. Now, a lot of that we and we do for you, such as creating this hurricane, creating and giving you the back appropriate background. Guess how you'll be drawing this? It's a turtle program. That's what this is. It's just turtles. And uh, this is one of those homeworks that where 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 it looks hard. It's one of my favorites because it looks harder than it actually is. Once you know what's going on, it's actually not too bad. So uh, again, it's due quite a bit of like quite a ways from now because of spring break, but. Uh, that's why uh, Thursday we'll be doing this lecture virtually, most likely, so that I can, uh, because, again, half the lecture is going to be meeting me meeting with individual students who had issues, uh, who, ha who are having issues getting this running. And sometimes, so 90% of the time, it's because you think the file is somewhere and it ends up being somewhere else, or you're working on a copy of a file that's somewhere else, so it gets all messed up, all confusing. So just trying to help you untangle that. Um, but 10% of the time, it's something interesting and weird and then i have to actually spend time doing it and it's not really fair to hold you up hold who everybody up who's already gotten that taken care of so like again after that first part of the lecture we'll be able to dismiss class um for for thursday okay now you'll notice also for today i didn't actually have anything um record you know scheduled in the overview for today sequences and file reading. We got, again, we'll do be doing the file reading later on, but for this one, well, what are we gonna do? Well, we've got a couple, I've got a couple uh, different options. I can give us more practice on functions and function calling, or I can, oh, there's a couple of different 
good exercises in the book. I was torn between basically doing a pig Latin exercise that I came up with a couple, yeah, a couple of years ago. And then there's also one on the substitution cipher and cryptography. And I honestly think that's a bit more interesting, but I haven't really done this project before. So God knows if I'm going to be doing it the way they want me to do it. But it'll be interesting. What do you think? Want to get an introduction into cryptography? Okay. So let's go ahead and open up our, your textbook to uh, the substitution uh, cipher. That's project nine in your textbook. So go to Brunestone, go to substitution cipher. Okay, now computer science has a bit of a history. Um, we didn't really come into our own as like its own academic field until like the past century, um, but the pieces of it are scattered throughout history. Um, partially in engineering, partially in linguistics, partially in mathematics. Um, for instance, graph one. Uh, for, for instance, the bridges of Hohenberg. I think that it. No, bridge. Why? 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 No. Euler. Bridges. Euler. Königsberg. There we go. The seven bridges of Königsberg. Miss, I missed the, the, some of the letters. That's from 1739 and basically is the basis of graph theory, which is one of those, which is one of those domains of mathematics that ends up squarely in computer sciences domain because we use it so gosh darn much. Um, and that one was basically uh, asking, we've got these four islands here, okay, um, connected by bridges. Can you, uh, can you go over each bridge once? And Euler was able to sit down and go, mathematically, no, you can't do it. Um, the problem eventually got solved by World War II when uh, a couple of the bridges got destroyed. So there you go. Um, um, yeah, current present state of the bridges. Two, two of the seven original bridges did not survive the bombing in World War II. Two were others were later demolished for, um, for them. Three bridges remain, only two are were from Euler's time. So um, therefore an Eulerian path is now possible. <laughs> so that's uh, pretty, I find that to be pretty funny. But, even, but possibly the earliest thing that falls into computer science's domain is warfare. Specifically, I want to send orders to troops and if they get, and if my message, message gets inter intercepted by the barbarians, I don't want the barbarians to be able to read it if they even have somebody can read. And when I say barbarians, I don't mean like this weird kind of arbitrary distinction between civilized and uncivilized people. I mean, the difference between Romans and what they considered barbarians, which was people who were not part of the Roman empire because they all didn't speak Latin. And so all their terminology sounded like bar, 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 bar. I'm serious. That's actually that. That's where the original Greek for barbarian comes from. That that it, you can look it up. So, uh, so you want to send something to tr uh, troops. In fact, the hello world of cryptography is this following message: attack at dawn. That is basically hello world, but for cryptography. Basically, encrypt this message and, uh, in some way, shape, or form. Now. So that, and then again, we're talking Roman Empire. So that's going like, you know, you know, that's going uh, BCE and, you know, and after it is BCE and CE. Okay. Now, um, this was, now it really, really became apparent that we needed computers to solve these kind of things or computational operations in the, four, in the 30s and 40s. Around World War I, you could still ostensibly hand a mathematician a bunch of, uh, of, of intercepted encoded messages and reasonably expect them to maybe decode a few um, you know, by the next morning. And that would hopefully be useful. But once things like the Enigma machine came into play and other machines, the, if you needed machines to be able to decrypt them. Um, and that is again, what, one, what Alan Turing worked on, in England on, and that besides his whole contributions to computer science, this is what he's more famous for, which is the development of the bomb, which is a computer, well, 
a special, a specific purpose use, a specific computer with a specific purpose to build a machine that decrypts the uh, intercepted Enigma messages. Okay. So the idea here is that we've got some secret message and we call it ciphertext. Can you decode it using pencil and paper and enter the encrypted message into what we call plain text? So we have something called ciphertext. Okay. The Enigma machine does this. It basically takes something and makes it gobbledygook or something that looks like gobbledygook. Now, it uses one type of cipher, but this today we're going to be learning about a much more simple cipher called the substitution cipher. So I've given you one hint, but you don't, uh, but if you still don't get it because it's a lot just to throw at you, okay, then let's go ahead and, 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 and look at this. So the idea between a substitution cipher is that we replace one letter with another. So we've got this secret message, C-L-G-U-B-A-E-B-P-X-F. Okay. So let's see. So let's see, is it attack at dawn? Let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, Nope, not attack at dawn. It's too long. It's one letter too long or one letter too short for that. So um, yes. Oh no, I thought I saw. It. Let's see, let me. I'm gonna go and make a basic kind of though. So. Yeah, I thought so. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, I think I know what it is. Okay. So what we see here is, an, again, a message. How would you go about decoding it in the first place if you got some message and you wanted to change it into plain text? Any ideas here? Anyone? So the first thing is that while it looks like gibberish, no language is gibberish, even if you disguise it. Yes. Start with the repeating letters over here or repeating letters that show up more often, like the two Bs. So let's see. Um, so it's a good idea. The idea here is that with Python, sorry, with uh, these messages is that, is that English has what we call a fingerprint. It has a frequency analysis that can be performed on it. You can see that basically, if you, we know that, for instance, you learn probably from like a game like Wheel of Fortune that the most common letter is what in the English alphabet? E. So letter frequencies, English. And so you can make guesses based off of how long your, your uh, string, based off of how long a, if you've got a big enough string, you can make long, uh, guesses that the most common letter is E, the next most common would be a T, and the next uh, most common letter would be an A. This is not a particularly long cipher. Let's see, check me. Nope, try again, but here's an in. B is equal to O, aha. Uh -huh. So now we can move somewhere. So they give us a hint for trying. So these Bs are O's. So let's go ahead and write this down. So we know that B goes to O. And let's see. And C goes to P. So let's go ahead and take this, throw it in a notepad. So we want our Bs to be O. O. And our Cs go to P. Let's see. Ciphertext, plain text. 
Okay. So let's go ahead. So let's see. C can be, let's go ahead and get these G and T. All right, so let's go ahead and plug these in. Oh, and I haven't done this one before, by the way. So I'm operating kind of blind, only kind of. Uh, so, and the right corresponds to plain text. Aha, uh -huh. okay. And the right corresponds to plain text. So we move this side over. So L goes to Y. C, C goes to P, and then G goes to T, yeah. And then O, B goes to, and then B goes to O. So any guesses as to what that, uh, what U is gonna be? H, it's gotta be H because, and this has gotta be N because that would make Python and that in this context makes a lot of sense. So let's see. Oh, and I'm missing an F on the end. There we go. So I'm gonna give a, I'm gonna go ahead and guess that it's Python rocks based on knowing how textbook writers write things. Now, this is what we call a substitution cipher. What has happened here is that we took one letter, okay, and substituted it with another letter. Every single letter got swapped with another letter. B went to O, G went, I gave to T, L went to Y, and I don't see anything in the bottom that appears in the top, so it doesn't tell me any more information about how they did that. But the idea here is that Bait is that you notice that based on nothing but context, we were able to solve it. Yes. Ah, I hit the most annoying key in the world, uh, the insert key. So insert does over. So insert, which is one of those weird keys on 100% keyboards by delete and all the others, um, does the whole does the whole overwrite thing. Um, you rarely use it except in cases like this where you deliberately want to overwrite empty spaces. Um, it mimics the old kind of style of writing with a typewriter. Where you can't delete things, but you overwrite it. Context is everything. In fact, a lot of the reason why, one big part of the reasons that, um, that, that the Enigma machine was able to be cracked was because of context of messages with, inter with uh, with intercepted messages. They would almost always re uh, repeat, start the same way. They'd almost always end with Heil Hitler. And so that made your, your beginning and your endings known quantities, which made it easy to crack. Now, with regards to the, um, and then of course it doesn't hurt when you are intercepting things from a radio, from a, from a state, from basically an outpost in the desert, where basically it says the weather is sunny, nothing to report every day. Again, known quantities. Context is everything. A lot of times when we break these messages, when hacking occurs, it's not because somebody has broken an encryption method. Our encryption methods these days are rock solid and basically near unbreakable. It's because somebody made a mistake, a human error somewhere, and leaked information otherwise. Remember, Mm -hmm. Let's see, password. Let's see. Yes, movie hacking versus real hacking. If I can just overclock the Unix to Django, I can basic the DDoS root. <laughs> Whereas real hacking is, hi, this is Robert Hackerman. I'm the county password inspector. This general, this I, I wish this was more of an exaggeration than I, I wish this was more of an exaggeration than it actually is. It is very that is what I mean by leaking information. Now, the most 
Now, the earliest substitution cipher is the Caesarian cipher attributed to Julius Caesar, back to the Romans. Told you this was old. And he did this to encrypt his private com uh, uh, conversations, uh, private correspondence messages. And the way this worked is that you simply shift every character by three, uh, by fixed number of positions. So in other words, in other words, if I wanted to, uh, the Caesarian cipher might look something like this. Oh, we can actually, why, why, why am I gonna do it? Caesar cipher, it's already on Wikipedia. Been there for as long as Wikipedia was a thing, I'm almost certain. The idea here is that every letter is shifted over a couple. So here, a is shifted to X, B is becomes Y, C becomes Z, D becomes A, E becomes B, F becomes C. Very easy to defeat once you know that somebody using a Caesarean cipher because there's only like one of 26 different, one of 25 different encryptions you can use. Not 26, even though there's 26 letters because the 26th encryption would bring you back to the beginning. It would, you know, it would move your moving your letter 26 forward gives it this but it be, but it works here's the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy doll it looks like gibberish and if you're just simply some warlord who's intercepted a message and you know you're lucky you can even read latin this is this is going to stump you very good chance of stumping you unless you've got again insider knowledge so um, one of the most famous ones on, uh, on the internet, uh, the most, and we still use that today, even on um, the internet, I think, what is it, mod, mod 13, I think? Mod, thir mod 13, or what is it, Caesar Cipher 13. I can't remember the name, but basically doing a, a Caesar cipher of 13 is very was used to be very popular on the internet because it was a way it was kind of an in-group indication that you could uh, that you were able to communicate privately out, out in public. But anyway, so let's go ahead and look. So how so write a program that will encrypt the string referenced by the variable plain, plain text using a Caesar cipher of shift 13, store the result in ciphertext. In other words, it wants us to create a variable called ciphertext. And it wants us to figure out how to encrypt it from what we get to this weird GERD, um, you know, this weird string. So how do we go about encrypting it? We want to move it basically 13 letters forward, okay, right? That's what we want to do. We want to meet, uh, move each of these letters forward by 13 characters. Make sense? So how in the world do we do that? Because honestly, I don't want to have to sit down over here and go, okay, so T goes to this, um, you know, a, you know, H goes to this. The way this was traditionally done, by the way, before computers was with a small little device like this where basically you'd spin the dial to ma match up your, your encryption and decryption. And so, and you would just simply know, you'd be told in advance what kind of key you'd be using. So how do you do this? Well, we're gonna be using some nice advantages that Python have, or that just computers have, which is that every letter you have in Python is in actuality, just numbers. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, I mean exactly what I say. Um, if I, so H for instance, or well, we start out with T, so we'll go with T. T, we can throw it into a function called ORD, which is short for ordinal. And that gives me a number, 116. Now I'm gonna go through this step by step because it's still, it still stumps some of my students in data structure and I tip in data structures and I've, typically give them the code to do this when they have something with encryption and data structure. But the idea here is that we can convert um, this number. We've got 116. So say I wanted to move this le a letter three, I wanted to do a Caesar cipher of three forward, right? So QRS T, U, so T, 
UVW. Say I wanted to encrypt this into W just automatically. What I could do is I could take 116 and add three to it to get 119. And then I can use the CHR command, which takes a number and converts it into the corresponding Unicode. Uh, it takes the number and converts it into the Unicode string. 119. W, and you bet that this 120, X. This is because that Unicode is based off of something called ASCII, which we've referenced before in this class. ASCII. An old ASCII table from Wikipedia, that will work. Right, and over here, it's got the number of bits that it is, so it doesn't, it's not very useful, but in terms of, unless you can really instantly convert binary, and I can't, but what we can see here is that in this table, that lowercase t is 116, lowercase u is 117, w is 119, x is 120. So just like we were doing here, it's the same thing. On the left and right, we have octal notation, um, and which is base eight. And on the right, we have hexadecimal notation, which is base 16, which is useful depending on what system you're working in. I've never worked in octal other than somebody giving me, me it to me as an example in class. Whereas hexadecimal you sometimes use if you're getting down into systems level stuff. For the most part though, programmers have just decided we don't need to know this. Let's just let the computer handle it. And I'll just work in, in decimal, which is uh, very, I think, the right decision for most cases. So now though, the issue becomes, well, what if I wanted to, in so X, Y, Z, yeah. What if I wanted to get the cipher for encoding X by moving it forward three? X, Y, Z, A. So we add three to this, right? And we get, yeah, that's what an A looks, right? A curly brace, right? Looks like a curly brace. The issue is, of course, is that there's letter, there's characters after this, you know, I, and just to be clear about this, they, they, they are, they are arbitrary characters all up the Unicode, because that's what Unicode is designed to do. It creates characters everywhere. In, for, for every, it's a way to make sure that basically I can communicate with anyone in the world in any language and not have an issue with it, okay? So, and so what we need to do, so we kind of understand that if we want to uh, take a letter like A, so given A, what we want to do is turn it into a number. So if we're given a letter like A, we want to turn it into a number. Give me one second. I'm going to try to shrink this and move it up so it's a bit e so it's a bit more in the middle of the screen. Okay. We want to take a letter like A, turn it into a number, add the amount of shift we want to add to it, the amount of numbers we want to move it forward, right? And then turn it back into a character. So say again, for the context of moving it forward three, it would look something like this. But when we get closer to the end of the alphabet, but sorry, what if the shift would basically move that letter, you know, beyond what we want it? We have to have it wrap around in some way or shape or form. So what we typically do in this case, and, and when I say typically, I mean, I sure there's other ways that exist, but I haven't seen it yet. We we use some math to basically um, get all of our letters out of this range from I don't know to I don't know um, ninety seven to one twenty two and I know a, lowercase a is ninety seven only because I've used it but honestly that's a lot to remember ninety seven to one twenty two much easier if we work in the in a range that we that makes sense for us which is like one to 26, except we don't want to start at one. So we'll start at zero. Well, so zero to 25, 
right? And then if we add, so basically in that case, if, if we let A be equal to zero, I can add a number like 25 to it, and, or I can, and we want to shift five, it's perfectly fine. If I've got a letter like T, which was, let's see, so T in that alphabet would be ORD of T, and I'll explain what I just did here in a, in a minute, minus ORD of A, that's the 19, that's the 20th letter. So it is number 19 here. And then we could add whatever we wanted. To, then we could say, if we wanted to shift that, we could do, oh, say we wanted to shift it forward 10. That'd give it, we, that's the 29th letter, but we don't want letter 29. The 29th letter isn't the valid letter. Valid letters are from zero to 25. So we need to use modular arithmetic. And that lets us know that it is D. And I'll just show you right here. Ord of, so three plus ord of A car D. I know the math was blazing, was very quick and a bit hard to follow. So let me break it down step by step. Okay. And I'll do so by writing a function because it's much easier if we do these things by function. So def encrypt car, given a, or encrypt, yeah, we can call it car. So we're given a letter, some letter, and a shift amount, an amount we, call, we wanna shift it. And what we're going to do is that we are, we, we take this letter and we want to encrypt it. So this letter starts out in range, starts in range of 97, of what? 97 to 122. <clears throat> want to move to range zero to 25, right? The idea here is that we were working in a range of letters that doesn't make sense for basically wrapping around. So what we're gonna do is that we are going to change it to a range of zero to 25. So first um, we're going to go ahead and get the letter. We're going to get the ASCII, I'm gonna call it the ASCII value is equal to ORD of letter. That remember turns that into a number. Right, it gives us the number that corresponds to this. And that's its ASCII value. And then we can say letter val. Okay, so this is the 97 to 122, 22. And letter val is going to be this, which is ASCII. And I'm breaking this up into multiple more steps than I have to, just so I can be clear about, about what I'm doing here. Minus, and this is the what, what I find to be the hardest part for, for students to make the logical leap to, minus ord of A. What this does, so what of ord of A, that is 97, but I don't want to hard code 97 in because that's, it just seems like a magic number and magic numbers are bad. Uh, I, I want a way to, so rather than trying to remember what 97 is, I'll just be explicit. I want the letter value of A and I'm gonna subtract that from ASCII value. That's gonna, so all the letters start at 97. So subtracting 97 from them, will bring it into the range of zero to 25. Okay, this is just another way of writing 97, but I wanna be clear that what I'm doing here is, has to do with the fact that, that the range starts here at 97. So now that we have this, we can, we can encrypt it. We can do the encryption. Encrypted val is equal to, and I'm doing parentheses in here uh, in just a second, is equal to 
the ASCII val plus the shift. So move it up by this many letters and then keep it in. And now we need to keep this in the zero to 25 range. That's what the modulo 26 means. Keep it in this range, right? Because modulo kind of acts like, a, like the way it, it turns all that mathematics we are working with kind of into the way a clock works, right? Where basically if, if it's 11 o'clock, and five and then it's five hours later, it's now four o'clock. Modular arithmetic is something you've been doing all your life. You've just been doing it in mod 12 or mod 24. And it's a bit weird because there is a 12 o'clock and not a zero o'clock, which is unless you're working a military time. Uh, so now that we've got this encrypted value. We are going to do encrypted letter is equal to and I'm gonna just combine two steps here, which is that I'm going to take encrypted val. One second. Add twenty. Add the uh, the ninety seven we subtracted back in, and I'm going to turn that into back into a letter. Encrypted letter. And now I'm going to test this by saying. Um, this wanted us to do 13, so I can say print encrypt car, and we're going to take the letter, which is, let's say, T, and we want to shift it 13. And run. Let's see if I created any errors for myself. So Z. What's the shift? Shift of 13. Let's see. Well, using the Cipher Cipher of shift 13. So was I getting Z? And I got Z for T? Let's see. So as I got Z for T, let me go ahead and see just one quick thing. Did they want me to go the other way? Did they want me to shift the other way? Sometimes they're ambiguous. Nope. Didn't think it would matter. Or are they, let's see. So it's expected to be equal to GERD. And it is the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. So 13. User cipher inner dial to match up the way you want. What am I missing here? What is line five? Oh, yeah. Thank you. I was just simply talking without type without thinking about it. Okay. Thank you. ASCII value over here. Letter value. Letter value plus the shift. There we go. Yeah, I forgot to, I, I was just still using this thing. So that was, of course, giving me the wrong answer. So now, G, there we go. Yeah, I just didn't, I didn't reuse the, I didn't use the variable that I had, I had created. I instead used the one over here that I used to create the variable. The dangers of talking and writing code at the same time. So we start with G, so we have T, we give it 13, that gives us G, which is what the answer expects. So now what we're going to do is that we are going to create a for loop to handle all this. For, so let's go ahead and do this. For, and the ciphertext will just simply act, act as an accumulator here. For letter in plain text, ciphertext plus equals, we're gonna 
add, for each letter, we're going to add um, encrypt char letter and 13. And that passes passes because because since we shifted the first one correctly and we hand, uh, we and we handled modular arithmetic, it's going to shift the other ones correctly as well. And the fun thing about this is that because it's modulo thirteen, sorry, because we're shifting by thirteen and there's twenty six letters in the alphabet, uh, we can just simply if you want to decrypt this message, you don't have to write a separate function for decryption. You just encrypt it. You just do the same encryption algorithm on it. Um, so for instance, original, here you don't have to type this bit in, but I'm just trying to show you, original and ciphertext Encrypt character original. Print original. And that gives us our original text. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. Why? Because encrypting by 13 gives us gibberish, but encrypting by 13 again gives us a total of encryption of 26 which is getting back to the beginning. Hit the share code button and see, and hopefully that works this time. All right, so there's only 25 possible rotations. So now that we've got this function over here, the encrypt character function, I'm going to go ahead and copy it down here. But the way this works is that we can also use it to decrypt the, char uh, the characters of this. So here, if you're, yeah, if you're a clever spy, it won't take you very long to write a Python program that can try all possible combinations to, to figure out what the plain text message was. Here is a new cipher. So why don't you try your hand at decoding this? Remember, there's only one in, tw possible tw one in 25 possible combinations. So just simply try them all and the one that doesn't look like gibberish is the one you want, right? So take a few moments to try your hand at decrypting this. There's use you want to use the encrypt character um, message. Sorry, the encrypt character. And if you had trouble getting that, I will first off drop it on Zoom and then I'll drop it on Discord. find myself using it more and more to do things like dropping the message and stuff. Okay. There we go. Okay. Seriously? There we go. I can hear it go go off in the class. That's pretty funny. Okay. Let me run this and see what it wants from you. Oh, it doesn't want anything. It wants you to ask, it wants you to figure out what the original shift to it was.
Let me go ahead and go over this. So, this one. I, I, I prefer. I'm, I, I don't like to try one thing at a time, so I'm just going to simply do that. Uh, do four shift in range. Um, let's see, zero to up to, but not including twenty six. Um, so plain text is equal to. And what we're going to do is say four letter in plain text, sorry, four letter in ciphertext. So for each letter that we have, we are going to, I'm going to use encrypted again. I'm going to use encrypt as well to move it forward a bit more. And then that's going to kind of mess up the math for the next part because we're decrypting, because we're using encryption to decrypt it, but that's fine. Encrypt car. Letter shift plain text plus equals print shift letter no that's not, not letter plain text and so what we'll see here is that we've got a couple of different things. And then Minnesota United Football Club is the only thing that's not gibberish. Um, yeah. So here we might sit now, of course, if we plug in, next question says, what was the original shift? And if we put in nine, it's going to say no. The amount of shift to get it back, but it's not symmetric. That's what it's saying. Because what we're saying is that we shifted it forward. It shifted it forward X amount. And then if we moved it forward nine more, we got to the number we wanted. So let's see. So it'd be, I think, what, 25 minus shift? So let's see, 16. Oh, yep, sorry, 26 minus. Seventeen. Seventeen, because we because it the original encrypted it seventeen, 
add nine more, that gives us 26. That's the, which is the total amount that we had to move it, move it forward. Now, so the idea here is this is not very sure. Um, now we call what we use to encrypt something called the key. And here we only have 26 pop, we have only 25 possible keys. Um, if now, yeah, if we agree that we can mix up the alphabet into any, into any uh, with mixed up alphabet acting as a key, we can have a much better set to choose from. So the, what we did, so after this, what we got to was the veneer cipher. Now, and we're going to be doing a variation of that over here, it looks like, but in the air cipher. This is about the state of the art all the way up until about World War I. Up through World War I, it was certainly state of the art for, well, for Civil War period. Um, it was called the indecipherable cipher until, uh, in, because it survived from 15... Uh, 53 to 1863 until some really nifty mathematics came out about finding about figuring out what that fingerprint for a language was. And the way it worked was that you would have a square like this. It works the same way as a Caesar cipher does. You shift every letter forward a certain amount. The difference is is that that uh, that amount you shift it forward, isn't one key. Your key is instead a word or some phrase, typically a word because words are easy to remember. Here, for instance, we have attack at dawn. And what you do is you choose a, a, a keyword. You have a shared keyword between you and who you want to communicate with, in which case they're using lemon because that's, I think that's actually pretty funny. Um, so you just simply start spelling lemon, lemon, lemon until you have enough lemon uh, characters for every letter in your message. So they have lemon, lemon, let. And what you do is you essentially do A plus L. Then you do E plus, uh, sorry, T plus E, T plus M. So even though you get, um, even though you've got two, you know, even though you've got two Ts, they encrypt into different letters. So fairly good there. Now, the longer your, 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 your keyword, the harder it is to remember, or it could even be a key phrase, the harder it is to remember, but the more secure it will be. The idea here though, is that you can, and here's what they, they show, by the way, there's something called the Kaskiski examination. There's a few different ways of, take advantage of the fact that repeated words are by chance sometimes encrypted by the same key letters, le reading, leading to repeated groups in the ciphertext. So for instance, if they use A, B, C, D, crypto is short for cryptography. You see that the same thing appears twice just by happenstance. That crypto gets encrypted the same way just by happenstance. So they are, again, that's, what, that's kind of a leak of information. The, the most secure cipher we have that we can't, that doesn't have any kind of, now, mind you, modern computers with the way they use, you know, RSA and the like, the keys are just long enough that we don't care anymore. Um, but the one truly secure way is the one time pad or sometimes where your keyword is just as long where, you're, where, you're, where you have a secure keyword that's just as long as the message you want to encrypt. Thus, there's only one possible way to encrypt it, one possible deep way to de, but millions of possible ways to decrypt it, and only one of them is correct. The idea here is, is that you have a, no, I don't want to download the NSA thing. Um, you have this chart over here that has random randomly pulled letters, randomly generated letters. You make two copies. You hand one uh, and you put all the letters in, in uh, just a series of letters in the pad. You hand one to person A who wants to communicate, hand it to person B who wants to communicate. They use this to communicate. They keep these things safe because now the entire safety of the algorithm is predicated on keeping these one-time pads safe. 
And what you do is that basically if, if I'm making a message 10 letters long, I use the first 10 letters. And then for the next message we use, we use however many letters that long that is and so on and so forth. These are completely randomly generated. There's only one for me and one for you. This is about as, as, um, as good as it gets in terms of uh, being able to, to, to make this as, as cryptographically secure as possible. It is, however, not completely secure because it relies on humans. Uh, there is no crypto cryptographical defense against a subpoena. There is no cryptographical defense against, uh, against force. Applied force can, can give you the keys if somebody has access to them. So that is part of the issue there. So generally, we don't go this far for every single message. Uh, but honestly, the message of, you know, the lemon technique of using of, uh, the veneer cipher, where you have a keyword, worked pretty darn well. Like I said, it would take hours. It's possible to decrypt these um, by hand. It takes hours. Now it's a bit easier to do. In fact, you know, in security classes, decrypting the, uh, the you know, decrypting uh, messages sent by Enigma machine is current, it, that's now a homework exercise, essentially. That, because your computers can do it and they can do it quickly. Took mine a bit of a long time because it was, it was rotating the gears in the opposite direction I should have, so. Uh, but okay, so going back to this is that instead instead of oh suppose we have our plain text alphabet as a b c d for a Caesar cipher instead of doing module arithmetic suppose we create a second version of the alphabet but rotated by thirteen so like this and now to encrypt our message we just simply take the we would just find the letter on the top row and replace it by the bottom. And what they're saying over here is that, and I'll line this up, that they are going to, and we're still dealing with a simple, now this is a bit of a step back. This is a substitution cipher. We're basically, what we're doing is that we're saying for each of these letters, there's one, to, there's one thing we're gonna turn it into. So A is going to go to M, B is going to go to W, E is going to go to spaces the true most common character in the English alphabet, in any alphabet pretty much that uses spaces because every word requires space after it, unless it's ending with a period or comma, but you get to my uh, point. And those, uh, those have spaces after them, so I guess my point still stands. So the way this would work is that we take our, and I'll go ahead and do this one for you because we are, strap for time, but I think this has been very interesting. Um, I hopefully you feel so as well. So we take our, uh, we can still use our encrypted character, this, in, this encrypted thing. The only difference is what we're shifting by, right? For our for loop, when we were doing uh, ciphertext is equal to this, we were doing for letter in plain text, ciphertext plus equals, um, we were doing this, ciphertext is, e is equal to encrypt car. Oh, here, oh yeah, we don't even need to use this part. I was skipping ahead the veneer stuff. Instead, so over here, rather than doing this, we were encrypting it with using our encrypted character stuff. What we do is that we'd say, okay, We've got our letter. We want to figure out, we get the index of where this is and replace it with what's the index in the key. So let's see if I'm, if I am interpreting this correctly. So ciphertext plus equals alphabet. So let's go ahead and actually do this. It's equal to, I'm going to use a variable before I declare it. Bad idea typically, but I'm going to say key index 
now we calculate what index is. Index is equal to uh, alpha bet dot index of letter. String has no attribute. What is it? Uh, index of? Well, sorry. Well, I, I, I have to forget. I'm working in multiple languages here, so I sometimes forget what the index operation is for strings. Or is it saying string has no attribute? Oh, right, because it's a string. Right. Will that work? Ah, no, bad. I, 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 I'm so used to hitting F5 to run that I hit F5, which of course isn't run. It is refresh the page here. Um, index of, so that's fine. I was over here. List, alphabet, save and run. List has no attribute index. Is it just index? Yes. There we go. So I didn't even need to bother with that. So get the index of this letter, store in, de in index, and replace it here. And the string we get is, we encrypt our message and our ciphertext is this, print ciphertext. Does anybody want me to go over this one in a bit more detail or no? Did I skip a couple steps for people? What we did is that we took the letter from this alphabet, we matched it up with the appropriate index over here. So for instance, where we saw an O, we got the index of that, and we got the same index in the key, and that's how we were able to encrypt it. Similarly, over here, we can do the same decryption. Which is, range, so for letter in range, so not in range, but for letter in ciphertext. Again, the issue is typing and coding at the same time, especially when you're doing something new. For letter in this, do, let's see, right? I'll just call it, oh, it's called plain text. They want me to store it in plain text. Plain text is equal to, or a letter in that plain text plus equals, and I'm just gonna do it in one line now. So it would be um, key, yeah, index, alphabet, key, dot index, letter and it says the sun was shining on the sea with all his might now this looks by the way i should mention terrible right yeah now just because you can put things in one Sorry, just because you can put things in one line doesn't mean you should, especially when what you're putting in multiple lines is the, uh, especially since you've got um, this inside of brackets. Oh, well, let me hit the share code and share code over here and share code over here. So just because you can doesn't mean you should. But what I'm saying, but what I did here is that I split up my line. My I split up the same line we were doing in the previous one. Which is that here's the find the index of this letter, but this time inside of key, because this is the encrypted message. So we're going to look in key and then we're going to do a verse lookup to find it in here. Make sense?
Okay. Now, current state of the art is something called public, or not state of the art, but current, what basically is used everywhere is uh, public key, uh, public private key encryption, as well as RSA. I don't know, I think this is RSA. Let's see. Yep, and some provide both, yeah, RSA. And the idea here is that these use the fact that you have a private, you can use a public key to decrypt something and a private key to encrypt something as, and use them in combination either to encrypt something or to verify that it was who it came from. Because um, it is a really cool thing. Um, but also if we click over here on the, on this, it says connection secure. More information over here. Um, security. Let's see. Yeah, this encryption encryption TLS AES two fifty six. Um, let's see. Which and then it, so we can look at that AES two fifty six advanced encryption standard two fifty six, which uh, uses a specific type of encryption that the US government really likes to use for their stuff. Now, the thing about this is that a lot of the old codes like ciphertext and the like, um, sorry, like the Caesar cipher, they relied on the fact that basically the, the method of encryption was secret. Veneer cipher also kind of relied on the, the fact that the method, the method of encryption was secret. Um, but, and even then, the fact that you had to keep the keyword secret, especially. This is not the way things work anymore. All encryption, all, most encryption algorithms are public and peer reviewed. It's the keys that keep everything safe, not the method. Because if you try to quote unquote, roll your own cryptographic method, generally you have the issue of introducing bugs that might, uh, that might release something. There's a pretty fun cipher that got created for um, for a book called Solitaire Cipher. Um, we go over it in 2168, but you know, a couple of years later, papers get published saying, hey, this has some cryptographic weaknesses uh, that make it fairly trivial. Um, not trivial, but easier. We don't like also, also as a programmer, it's never a good idea to create a secret method of doing something, to give it to somebody else, because now there's two people who hold a secret method of doing something. And the only way you really keep so, so, uh, something secret is if there's one person keeping something secret. This is why you don't wanna, you don't wanna create basically private methods for doing these things. Pre uh, peer review is kind of a good thing in this case. Also again, I mean, this stuff is public. These methods are public. AES-256, it's a standard used. It's used in encryption practices. It's what the NSA uses for top secret information. It makes it extremely hard for your stuff to get cracked in less of court. So how, again, how do things get hacked into these days? Human error, exploits in other systems that allow you to raise privileges to what you shouldn't have. Those kind of things. Again, most people don't realize uh, just like what kind of, you know, most people, the, the computer is just a thing they carry around. They don't realize that it can be, if, that if they're using their business computer with their business VPN on it, if somebody just leaves it, if they just leave it lying around, suddenly that's a, you know, a threat vector. Some companies are very strict about the way that, about their information security, uh, some less so. Um, but just keep that in mind. Um, Security is one of those fields that will, in computer science, that will never be uh, needing people in it. It's one, and a lot of it has to do with mathematics on the hard end of things, but a lot of it also has to do with psychology because you got to make sure that not just your, not just, you got to know how do people mess with your people to get into your systems, but also, you need also know psychology so you can convince people on your side, on your team, in your company to follow proper security um, 
features. Temple has been bugging you to do two-factor authentication for a while. Then they're eventually just going to force it. I've been using it for years. Why? Because if I leave my laptop lying around, I don't want one of you just simply logging into my version of Canvas and then changing everybody's grades. Two-factor authentication kind of helps with that. Make sure it, it ensures that you have to have both my password and my phone in order to do that. It's a, get it, so again, it's just kind of a, um, they're, they're, so again, it's a matter of like, how do you convince people to make to do this minor inconvenience and make it more pal palatable? All right. So that's what I have for today. Now, again, Thursday, I, I will send out an announcement, uh, but most likely that, that will be virtual. Also, because it will be virtual, I should have plenty of time afterwards on Thursday to discuss just general things. For right now, though, if you've got questions, I should be able to take a few up here. All right. Sure. I'll try to answer them a few, but I might have to like defer them for later. For, okay. For, for it's the like ones that pretty sure I got right, but they were more. Gone. Okay. <laughs> so for this one here, it put in sideways, and I told them it would. I even commented. Oh, yeah. Then then yeah, that'll be right. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that should be right. I bet you they, and that would be harsher than I would want to. Anyway. <laughs> okay. Okay. So that so um. There's that one. And then, and then for that one was that one put in fine. I okay. don't know why. And then for this one, I used the draw skirt, and I don't know if I wasn't allowed to do that, but I got a bunch off of that too. And I was like, Probably because you didn't have the draw square defined, but, but that again, I commented it in because I was like, oh, like, I mean, yeah. Let me read the comment. Okay, cool. Yeah, that that's fine. So okay, I will. Because I was like, I was like, I'm just gonna make sure those will things I'll be happy to correct for you. So okay. you, so don't feel bad about them. I'll be happy to correct those again. I told them when in doubt, grade stricter. Plus okay. again, when you're doing these things and trying to do them quickly, it can be yeah, you know. You. But again, I prefer to do these quick uh prefer them to be more strict because it is way easier for me to give these points back rather than you know take them off. Take yeah. them off. Yeah. So that should be definitely be another 15 points, it says. So yeah. It'll be fine. Okay. So just simply send those to me. Just, uh, um, my cow. Uh, you, you cannot just send me an email and I'll try to go through my emails to update these over the next week or so. Okay, I'll put um, screenshots on this. Oh, that'll be even better. So yeah. Thank you. Have a good one. Yes, your TA or any other TA. The other TA? Okay, great. And um, what, it's a two-hour window to demo something on the next time. Oh, that's four and five. Um, so that go into Spring Break. Yeah, I, well, for me, if you want to, I can de do demos over Spring Break. Okay, cool. And if you, again, those those two office hours are not the only time I can meet. I'm available to meet if you send a message, and I can probably arrange to meet some um, on a lot of evenings. Right. Okay. Thank okay. you. Demo. Um... Lab six. Yeah, let me see lab six very quickly. And then okay. Yeah, just show me. Um I did Mario more color. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go ahead and do um negative two. And so you did an a while true tri loop. Mm -hmm. So, um, let's see, and that's, and so that was it, so that if I do this, right, that it will still yeah, work. Yeah, it will just keep on running. Yeah. Okay. That's definitely one way to, that is definitely a way to handle that. So let's do seven. Okay. Let's go to the next one. Yeah, I do have credit. Mm-hmm. Okay, credit card. So grab um so grab a, a a visa card if you don't mind. Yeah. 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 Either of them before with a bunch of ones is always a good one. Because then you can switch it to a four with a bunch of ones and a single two. Yep. There we go.
And then can you do the same card number, but instead change it from four a bunch of ones to the same number, but add one to it. So it's like a two okay. um, at the end instead of a one. Just paste it. I don't, didn't like that. So yeah, that's probably not. And then a two. The end. There we go. Okay. Last name. H U A N G. Huang. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so I'm, I'm having a lot of trouble with the, the, the labs four and five. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering if you could like take them to like do it, but like now that we would you want to like schedule a Zoom meeting? Time, so or? Zoom meeting might be good. So first yeah. pass, you don't want to do that. Pass just simply means a a pass, first off, just means that we would that um I put that in as kind of a placeholder. Okay, so it doesn't really do any, anything here, but for a draw square, you want to use a for loop over there. This is definitely something I'd want to work on with a Zoom meeting over, over you. Do you have time? Let's see. Do you have time uh, tonight or tomorrow night? Uh, tomorrow night would be better. Better for me too. So let me go ahead and um, use the Zoom link, but let's see. Um, what, okay, I'm available at, from five on. Okay. What time works for you? Uh, five. Five? Okay. Let me, let me give myself some, yeah, five. So name? Chris. Okay. Just use the Zoom link and I'll be there. All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any question about the quiz? Sorry. Um, this one got marked incorrect. I copy and pasted it over here, and it works. They're probably just moving a bit too quickly. Um, let's go ahead and see. Um, printout one two hundred. Oh yeah, that totally worked. The the abs is a bit of an overkill, I think there, but um, oh no no, that's what makes it work. Okay, great. Let's see. Last name. Campbell, C A M P. Yep. Let me go ahead and um, we'll go ahead and correct this right now because I've got barely enough time to do that. So, exam one, let me go ahead and words for a second. Let's show on everything, but now I'm disconnected. Come on. <laughs> it takes a while to do. Okay. Am I able to demo? Um, to not today. I want to make sure I have time for. Him, but was there another question on the exam? No. Nope, All right. I'm going to hit update on your grade. It, if you refresh the page, it should take effect. Um, which you, which you know, so seven more points than what you had, or Thank how you. many? What was that? Okay. Appreciate it. So Thursday and Friday, I was going to leave the lab floor. Mm -hmm. I to like so what did, was this fixing what we needed? Uh, no, like uh, Thursday, you didn't have time to like. Get oh, home. yeah, yeah. And Friday, I had class during your office hours, so I wasn't able to go. Right, through. right, right. Yeah, so, so here, these all look good. I, yeah, I remember because I had to, I, I canceled. Did I cancel you? Uh, no, I just had class, so okay. I couldn't go to any of the office hours. Yeah, this started. Yeah. Okay. Then yeah. Start, I'll, I'll take that. It's um, five. Okay, great. And then those are the what's called turtle. the turtle. Yeah. So we're going to go ahead and I'm going to comment out the draw row and the draw grid. Instead, we're just going to do the stairs, the square stairs, All right. and then the inbound spiral because, oh, no, you did the super duper. So we can just simply comment that out because then I only have to run two programs now because the others call the others yeah. is the point. No, oh, I see. Okay, you did it so that was be nice and out of each other's way. Yeah, and that one not. I I didn't put the coordinates right. That's okay. Yeah. That looks good. What? Okay, so last name. Heroes two you heroes. Guillermo. Okay. You're taken care of. Thank you. You're welcome. 
And that gives you five extra points there. And then, okay. And then, thank you. Have a good one. Sure. It's about Irma. Is that a hard due date? It will be 